but it's absolutely a fair thing and something that we need to start shifting away from quickly. So we're going to react this with a base. What might we predict the base has? Yeah, what is something that you would expect all bases to have? Hydrogen. No. Most bases do not actually have hydrogen. Acids have hydrogen. So this now goes back to the definitions of acids and bases. I very much push our definitions a lot because if you can categorize the definition, you can now start to apply that to structures. An acid is a proton donor. What is a base? A proton acceptor. This definition becomes very problematic, right? Because the only reason we know it's a base is because it accepts protons. Why did it accept protons? What was the characteristics of the base that allowed it to accept protons? Looking at our definition, H+, plus, if it's going to accept H+, plus, what must the base be supplying? Electrons. Electrons. Okay? Electrons is a much better answer than negative. You're like, dude, but aren't electrons negative? Yes, absolutely. Okay? Except that bases don't have to be negative. They very commonly are because they need to have an excess of electrons. Right? So if we're going to define our base up here, what we're looking for within our base is that it has electrons. Okay? That with electrons could also be negatively charged, but we don't know that necessarily. Okay? So let's predict what would happen. We run this acid-base reaction. What happens? We remove the hydrogen. Okay? We can reference, oh, when we run an acid-base reaction, we get water and a salt. We don't get water and a salt. We get a salt, right? But we won't necessarily get water. That water reference is what you remember from Gen Chem, and that's kind of an old school definition because everything we ran was in water, okay? So that salt and something else now needs to come into play. What is the base doing? It's accepting an H. Where do you see H's in the other species? All over is a lovely answer. Okay, it's unfortunately not a useful answer, but it's an awesome answer, and I absolutely appreciate that answer. Okay, because we have that. We have that H. We have that H. And we have that H. Okay, there are lots of other H's within this. Okay, I've only colored them out because those are now distinct or chemically unique. Okay? There's also the H that's explicitly shown in black. Which of those H's should be the one we're talking about in this reaction? Why? Because um, since oxygen is especially electronegative, it makes the hydrogen especially positive. Okay? If we're going through and running a chemical reaction, the most acidic thing is going to be the most positive hydrogen. Which hydrogen of all of those is going to be the most positive? Okay, we'll look at what it's connected to. All the colored ones, if we want to call them that, are all connected to carbons, which means none of those hydrogens are really carrying a positive charge. Okay? But the one connected to the oxygen is going to carry a large positive charge because oxygen is more electronegative. So if we start to look for those polar covalent bonds, this is why it's important to identify all those bonds and intermolecular forces that we talked about back in unit one, we can now start to jump to those conclusions a little bit better. Okay? So what we want to do is remove that hydrogen. Well, where's that hydrogen going to go? To the base. To the base. How do I want to do that? So we're going to have H and we're going to have B. Theoretically, what's going to happen? For the base to accept the hydrogen, what has to change about my drawing, my depiction? Take out the H. And give it the new charge, whatever it is. Okay, I accept what you're referencing as the other half, which is fine. Okay. And I like that you said give it the new charge with what it, well, man. I erased that so I could have more space to draw, and then I didn't do it. Okay. 
It's supposed to have a ha what charge is it supposed to have? Negative. Why should the oxygen be negative? Because Say it again. Hydrogen was positive. It lost a positive, therefore it should become negative. Awesome. Why else is it negative? So you're saying, right, and I, I kind of like what you're saying and kind of don't, that if we were to draw on the electrons, we would see it has an extra pair of electrons. Ah, uh, okay, so what you're now adding is that this isn't just, oh, oh, I know it's acid base, but now you're trying to say is over here, we're going to add a description to what happened, okay? And if we look at that description of what's happening, the electrons in that bond had to go where? To the oxygen, so we're saying this. That oxygen has now gained electrons. Okay, that's what that arrow means. You know what I showed some in black and some in red? What are the ones in black? The ones that were already present. So if we have lone pair electrons in our system, that can help us function through this and we can see those changes. Why else do we know it's negative? So, uh, yeah, there we go. The common bonding patterns. Okay. Back in unit one, we said we needed to know these common bonding patterns so that when you see it, you know it's negative. Awesome. Okay? I don't like the common bonding patterns. I like that you've got it, and that's good. Okay? What I like is the let's follow what's happening with the electrons. Because okay? if you can get used to following what's happening with the electrons, you can predict things better. Okay? Have we shown everything that happened? What are we missing? The hydrogen went to the base. How? So this is what I initially asked, and then you shifted gears and said the other piece, which was good. How, how do I fix that? So in my head, I'm assuming that you get to find the one that can accept the hydrogen. If the base, like on your answer key. We haven't even gotten to addressing the answers yet. Wouldn't you uh, take an arrow from the lone pair of the base and we could say the base electrons went to the hydrogen. Awesome. What does that change in our answer? There it is. We need to be showing that bond. Okay. If our base started neutral, what happened? It's becoming positively charged. Okay. So what we're trying to identify is all those individual pieces and try and work our way through predicting how this functions. How do we decide if this reaction is feasible? What if it's not feasible? How would I change what's shown to say that this reaction doesn't happen like this? Putting a giant X through it, that means we just delete it, no. Because that's ignoring, that's now saying none of this is correct. Is this correct? Yeah. yeah, so don't delete it, you did a good job. Everybody's favorite class. Like I'm in my favorite class. You put arrows back Before you, uh, are you getting that right idea? Say it again. You put arrows back onto it, the same What do you mean arrows back onto it and where are you talking about? The hydrogen here, so you want to add more arrows over here? So, in my head, I'm like, I'm resonating it out, like, how do you pull the hydrogen out and then I'm pulling it back in? So how do you pull it back in? It's already connected. <clears throat> I like it. Stop looking where I'm pointing. Okay. Misdirection. I don't want to look at it there because it's already there. Where is it not there? Yeah. You had it. Your eyes did it. Base. That's fine. Oh, dude. That's me, man. You're the one answering the question. Um, over there. Yeah. On the other side. Uh, how about the other side of the arrow, where the hydrogen isn't connected to it? So what you could da do is add curved arrows over here, saying that these electrons 
go to the hydrogen. And then the electrons would go to the base. You could do, and absolutely fair game. I, I do accept that. That gets real messy real fast. Okay, and that's something we don't want to do at least very often. Because when we talk about a mechanism, what we're doing here is a mechanism. We're showing curved arrows say, this is how this reaction works. Okay? And we talk about how it works. We start at a beginning and we end at the end. And you're like, well, that's, that's obvious. Yeah, but what if your end has arrows talking about how you go back to the beginning? Now, what are your arrows referencing? <clears throat> Both directions, that becomes very, very confusing. So in a single step, it's okay. okay. But how could we get that same information in here that this reaction doesn't happen this way? Because even here, all you're saying is there's a competition, maybe. What do we add to this to make it clear that we don't know if the reaction's going forward or not? You mean you were supposed to take 152 before you took this class, and in 152 we were talking about equilibrium reactions the whole time? Yeah, this is an equilibrium reaction. That's exactly what we're talking about. So instead of saying the reaction just goes forward, I have to acknowledge that this reaction could go backwards. That's all you have to add. I don't need the blue curved arrows. Okay? Those are okay in a single step. Okay? But at this point, we're now being asked the question, which way should it go? Do we favor the red arrow or do we favor the black arrow? Well, how would you know? How do, how do we decide which direction our reaction favors? Okay. So if we're talking about our reaction progressing left to right, okay, if it's going to progress left to right, what we're saying is our reactants are more reactive than our product. And if they're more reactive, what does that mean they do? They react to make products. And because the products are less reactive, they don't react to go back to a more unstable species. So all of our reactions drive to something that is more stable. I think that's more reactive. Ah, how do we know it's more reactive? It's a good question. All we did was pick a generic system. Okay? Let's start with something specific now. Okay? So what we want to do, because what we're being asked to do here is select a base. Okay? We just drew it out generically as B. Okay? So which base do you want to pick? The first one, awesome guess. Let's start with that, B. Okay? As our potential answer here, we're going to start with H2O. What happens to H2O? if this reaction progresses forwards. Um, when, we attach it to the negative side of H2O. when the base reacts on our reaction, what happens to it? Gains a hydrogen. What happens to H2O? <clears throat> you mean if we're going to follow the way our direction is set up if a base gains the hydrogen and H2O is our base what should we do? Add a hydrogen and if it adds a hydrogen what does it become? H3O plus that belies some of the chemistry with it that I, awesome, you're like, what should we do with the electrons? Okay, so this is the same thing if we had written H2O bond to our hydrogen. I guess we're going to do this with a positive on that oxygen. Okay, and that's fair. Some people are like, I don't want to draw out structures. That's because gen chem is dumb. dumb. Sure. Right? That's fine, as long as you acknowledge H3O+. Plus. Okay, so now, how do we decide which way does the reaction go? Because that was your question. How do I know which way it goes? Well, what things are going to be more stable? Like forces intermittently, or? Sure. Everything's um, like hydrogen bonding, I guess. Dipole, dipole. 
Those are, you've listed off a bunch of forces. Which one of those is the most stable? Is the most stable? What does it mean to be stable? Unreactive. Unreactive. Does hydrogen bonding react? Yeah, in fact, it has a wicked strong attraction force. Okay, which would mean hydrogen bonding isn't most stable. It's least stable of that set. Most stable would be London aspersion. How is London aspersion different than hydrogen bonding? It's a hell of a lot weaker. Why? Because of the There's no charge. In hydrogen bonding, we have a large difference in electronegativity. We're generating partial charges. In London dispersion forces, they're incredibly weak because there's no charge. So we could use charge to predict where a reaction goes. If it is charged, it is more reactive. If we run under the assumption that our reactions should go to more stable things, which is a really good assumption, we could now go through and compare. What is the overall or what is the charge of my first reactant? Nothing. What is the charge of my second reactant? Nothing. What is the charge of my first product? What's the charge on my second product? Negative. Negative. Which one is more stable? The reactant side or the product side? Reactant. The reactant side, which means when I go back and look at my arrow in between, should it be the red arrow or the black arrow? Black arrow. The black arrow. If I do the black arrow, has a reaction happened? No. No, which means? Not the answer. That one now needs to be unselected. Okay. How do I unselect? Does that work? Unselect. There's no way this could possibly work, Mike. This is complete BS. You're just making stuff up. Yeah, it's just totally fair. I get it. I get it. Guys, okay, so let's move on to the next one. What's the next one? Uh, NaOH. NaOH. What's its charge? They're all neutral. Look again. This time is positive to hydrons. Why is it positive? It's an ionic bond. There it is. It's an ionic bond. Because it is an ionic bond, I know I have ions, which means that's not sodium hydroxide. That is sodium positive and hydroxide negative. Does the sodium ion do anything? Well, Mike, you never taught me that. I shouldn't have had to teach you that because when did you learn that? Gen chem. Gen chem. Sodium ion is a spectator ion. It just floats off and does nothing, which then means I don't care about it. The only thing I care about is hydroxide is the negative. If that's my base, what happens when I look at my product? It's more neutral. Or, uh, let's start with the yeah, I, I need to know what happened to the hydroxide. You're not wrong, but I need more descriptions. What should I draw here? And drawing neutral doesn't help me. Oh, water. water. OH, and I put an H on it because that's what happens in my acid base reaction. Okay? So we would draw the H bond. There's my OH. What happened to the charge? Goes away. So this was negative and this was neutral. Which way does our reaction favor? Right hand, the right side, product. Why? Because it's more stable because it has no charge. What's more stable? The product, the product is more stable because now the charge is neutralized. It's H two O, and the reactant side is just a charge, making it less stable. But what about the other product? Yes. When we went through our first discussion, it wasn't just this species versus this species. It was, I looked at both my reactants. I looked both of my products. And we look at both. On our reactant side, we have neutral and charged. When we look at our product side, we have neutral and charged. Dang. So can I use charge to evaluate the direction of the reaction anymore? This is how I break my pens. Charge disappears. I can't use it anymore. How do I decide how this reaction should work? Yes. Between the two charged, uh, one has resonance. 
So when we're now looking at those charged species, my focus is now deciding between this one and this one, which one is more stable? Well, how do I evaluate stability? Okay. One thing to do would be look at charge. They're both charged. Okay. But if I go through and evaluate, uh, well, I'm going to actually leave that one alone for the moment. If I continue to look for a difference, what's the difference between these? This one can do resonance. What does that resonance do to that negative charge? Gets rid of it. it stabilizes it. So now when I compare hydroxide negative to carboxylate negative, which one is more stable? Carboxylate, which then means? It's more, less reactive, so more likely to happen. Yep, which then means? Yes, the answer. That is an answer. Okay. And for the record, if you rewind back to what you were talking about, you said that we should favor the products. Isn't that what we just said? Yeah, but you said it for the wrong reason. Yeah, so Does that like, make sense? In this case, you're looking at both, not just the one and one. You're looking yep. at both in this case. And I would argue that we aren't looking at both. What are we looking at? We're looking at the least stable species on each side of the reaction. I don't care about the neutral carboxylic acid. I care about the hydroxide. Why? It's charged. That's melting. That's not. When I go to the product, I don't care about the water. I care about the carboxylate, the negative charged species. So our focus is hyper-focused onto that most reactive species all the way through. And what you have to do is quickly discern which one should be your focal point for each of those assessments. Kind of, sort of? Yeah. Should we do it again? Yeah. Good, we should do it again. I completely agree. And yeah. We should do it even more. I mean, we can do more. Let's move to the next one. Next one was NH3, okay? NH3, let's, let's level that up a little bit. Do you see any electrons on that? No, nah, so that must mean it can't act as a base, except what do we know from all the way at the beginning of the semester? Common Our common bonding patterns, if we have a nitrogen with three bonds, we know that that nitrogen also has a lone pair, okay? Now when we go through and predict this out, how do we decide, well, what happens to it? Okay. It'll become positively charged. None of the other ones became positively charged. Why not? Oh, that's a lie. H3O plus. I was wrong. H2O did. Okay. They become charged dictating based off of their starting charge state, which is why we left that off of this or tried to leave it off of this information. Okay? If we're going to go generic, we have to lose some information. We just have to decide is that information loss valuable or not. Okay? So now what do we go through to evaluate? Okay, so what's your assessment? Doesn't, um, wouldn't it be the same issue as last time where the uh, product would be more? Wait, no, wait. No, wait, it, we would just go back to the reactants, wouldn't it? Okay, why? You give me the conclusion, I want the why. Because um, since both the products are charged, they're inherently less stable? We're looking at our products being charged versus our reactants being uncharged, which would suggest which way should it go? back to the reactions, which means that one should be unselected. Okay, awesome. What we just walked through in this approach was a qualitative assessment. Okay, which might be enough of a phrase to realize that we've got an issue potentially coming in here. Qualitative assessments are not perfect. We talk about electronegativity. What element's the most electronegative? Fluorine, then... Okay? Because oxygen's right next to it. What's after oxygen? Nitrogen. Nitrogen. Why not chlorine? Chlorine's right next to fluorine. Why is 
chlorine not more electronegative than nitrogen? Okay. There's some explanation behind it that we don't understand, we don't know because we aren't quantifying it. Our trend tells us that it does this. The trend is fallible. There are issues with it. Well, if there's issues with it, why do we tell you to memorize it? Because the vast majority of the time, the trend does what we need it to do. This is a potential one that I genuinely actually don't know. Okay. Uh, actually... I do know. I just realized I know some of the numbers. Okay? And we should really double back to the actual quantitative data. That quantitative data, when we talked about this reaction, we said we wanted to form the weaker species. Well, we used qualitative data to explain which one was weaker, okay? based off of charge and resonance capabilities. Okay? How would we quantify weaker? It's a hard question. What are we looking at when we're evaluating the reaction all together? What is that species acting as? Oh, an acid. An acid. Okay. And so if we're going to predict whether this reaction works, that acid must be stronger than the acid on the product side. Or I could go through and look at the base and I could say the bases and I can evaluate their strength. How do I quantify the strength of acids or bases? No, unfortunately not. pH and pOH is how that acid interacts with water. We're not necessarily in a water environment and that becomes tricky. How do we evaluate whether that acid wants to give up its hydrogen more than another acid? KAs. We would actually have to look at quantification of the equilibrium constants. What do you remember about Ka values? They're stupid. They're awesome, awful. If we looked at a Ka value for this particular species, we, uh, I just remember, like, is it more to one side? Or I think it's more to one with more acid, right? Is that the backwards? That's cool. No one actually knows, or at least you all don't know. Some jackass online watching the video can look it up and be like, you're wrong. That's fine. Okay. Uh, this stuff just that, awful. that number looks awful, right? Why does that number look awful? Okay. So, two, three. Right? Did I do that right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Still really, really small. I'm choosing to write it with the power of 10. Why does that number look awful? How many people like powers of 10? Some honest people are like, uh, stop writing that, that's ugly. I don't want to look at powers of 10. You're right. When we talk about organic chemists, what was their counting capabilities? Okay. Well, my counting capabilities. Beyond 10, I'm a little troubled. Okay? Because 10 is when I've run out of fingers. Okay? You want me to now do a power of 10? I don't even know what that means. Okay, on top of which, what is the power of 10? It's a negative value. How good are we at negative values? No. So the human brain does not compute this number well at all. Scientists acknowledge that their brain sucked, and so we converted this number into something else that was more manageable. It's in scientific notation. How did we change Ka to make it a more manageable number? We took the negative log of it. We don't know negative logs. It doesn't matter. We just push the buttons in the calculator, and the calculator spits out that we get a pKa. Come on, pen. pKa of 4.2, which is acetic acid, but that's just beside the point. Okay. And we could then go through and do the same thing 
for our other species. Which one are we going to evaluate the pKa for? The NH3 or the NH4 plus? Why NH4 plus? It's a carbonic acid. It's the acid. If we're going to look at acids, the A of Ka, we'd better be looking at our acids. So we can look up the acid value of that. Okay? So the pKa's aren't things that I necessarily expect you to memorize, but I do expect you to go out and look for and reference them, particularly when they come in play. Okay? So we could look up the pKa for that, and we'll find the pKa for that is 10. So we now have two pKa's. What does that mean for us? What does it mean to have a pKa of 10 versus, I'm just going to write it as 4. Cool. Yes, one of them is substantially more acidic. Awesome. Which one's more acidic? Okay. This is where we'd have to know what's going on with logs or you memorize a little thing with it. The smaller the pKa, the stronger the acid. So when you go through and look at this, a pKa of 4 versus a pKa of 10, which one's the stronger acid? 4, which means which way does the reaction go? towards the products, because it's going to produce the weaker oh. acid. Damn. What did we say the reaction was going to do before we looked at pKa's? Go the other way. Shoot. So you mean the qualitative process fails? Yes, it does. <clears throat> there are certain circumstances under which it fails. Guess where one of them is? Anything involving nitrogen screws with the whole system. Okay. So does this mean that you should go through and memorize all of the pKa's so that you can quantify all of our reactions? You're a psychopath, sure. sure. Right. Perfectly acceptable. You can do it. It is very, very powerful. It allows you to predict a lot of chemical reactions. Okay. However, subtle changes to the structure will change those pKa's and may or may not affect your overall answer. So spending a bunch of time memorizing pKa's allows you to apply this content to acids and bases. But what happens if we don't look at acids and bases? You need a whole other rule set to try and go through and memorize. What's that whole other rule set? The qualitative approach that we just walked through. Which means what you should do is manipulate qualitatively and memorize critical changes to that system, where the qualitative system fails. What's one you should memorize? Your pKa with your nitrogen. A positively charged nitrogen has a pKa with a hydrogen on it, has a pKa of about 10. Okay. That's really important because it will allow us to answer this question to say that, yes, indeed, we actually have to select that NH3. And we know that by looking at pKa's. Could we have used the pKa's for water and sodium hydroxide? Yeah, it would have done the exact same process. But that means you would have had to memorize those pKa's. Did any of you memorize those? No. Okay. You may choose to. That's up to you. Okay. But you have to be aware that there's multiple approaches. Most of OCHEM is qualitative in approach because what we're trying to do is avoid numbers. Numbers will always haunt us. They're going to come back and affect us in certain places. Okay. What I try to do is point out the qualitative approach and then follow it up with, here's the things that you should memorize because they're where the qualitative approach fails. Kind of, sort of? So the NH3 was an option? Should be selected. Do you want to do the rest? Deprotonate, yep. Okay. Deprotonate is just removing that hydrogen, the acidic hydrogen. Okay, you ready to do the rest of them? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so sodium hydroxide, what was the reactive thing? Oh. Try again. The H did nothing. Oh, the oxygen, what charge is the oxygen? 
negatively charged. What's the reactive thing? What charges that oxygen? Negative. If sodium hydroxide worked, should this one? How about the next one? All three of those have almost identical pKa's. So all three of those should be selected, and your NH3 should be selected. I know, I just used an X when I used an X up there, but I said unselect next to the other X. What you're evaluating <clears throat> is those subtle differences in electronegativity, and we're using that to now predict chemical reactions. Same stuff as unit one, just applied deeper. Yay. Yay. It's a review. How hard could it be? Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Good enough, Ivan? Because that was your question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, we did acid. Did we actually evaluate acids? A little bit, but what was the answer based off of? Base strength. So what are we doing here? Exact same thing. Right? So what we could go through and say is, well, what's the reactive base in the bottom structure here? Why is the oxygen more reactive than the bromine? The negative charge. You mean the charge thing should be where you start? Yes. Absolutely. That's where we always start. Okay, what's the next one? Um, same thing. Negative. And the, yeah. Ah, okay. So if we think through this rule set that we're starting to talk about and trying to figure out predictions of reactivity, <coughs> we really only talked about two aspects. We talked about one, charge, and two, resonance. Are those the only things that contribute to stability? What else would contribute to stability? Size. <clears throat> size. Okay. What are we talking about when we talk about size? This becomes a very challenging question. So we look at these. We start at charge because charge was our first place to start. Okay. When you say size, what are you referencing? Um, I don't know. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> Absolutely fair. How's hard? I don't know. What do you mean by size? So are we talking about orbital size? So ultimately what you're saying, are we talking about the atom that's holding the charge size? Or are we talking about the molecule that holds the charge size? Okay, Because those are two very different things. Okay. Which one do you think is more important? Mm -hmm. Why would atom be more important than looking at the molecule? So let's pick some. No, sorry. So let's look at two negatively charged things. H minus versus O minus. Don't worry about octets. They're just negatively charged. Which one do you think would be more reactive? Hydrogen. Hydrogen. Why? Less electrons. So if I put more electrons on the oxygen and made it negative two? So when we're talking about our reactivity, we're talking about only a single pair of electrons at any given instant. That's all we care about. How many electrons can hydrogen hold? Two. How many electrons can oxygen hold? For any given instant, two. So we could start to look to electronegativity, okay? which is a difference between hydrogen and oxygen. I completely agree. Peyton, what else is the difference between hydrogen and oxygen? The amount of size. Size. <laughs> okay? size is a difference between hydrogen and oxygen. Okay? Why does that matter? Well, let's take a look at hydrogen. Here's hydrogen. 
Mm, we'll make it a little bit bigger. There's hydrogen, and we'll give it an electron. Boop. There's its, that's its negative right there, that little red dot. We go to that. Oxygen being bigger, Boop. little red dot. Exact same system. If we're talking about the reactivity of either of these atoms, what must that electron do? Where? Somewhere else. Somewhere else. <laughs> Gotta make it a little bit bigger so I can erase within there. Okay, move somewhere else. Did it react? No. Okay, fair. It moved again. Did it react? No. Okay, so it moving isn't useful. Where is it moving to? What must it do to react? Okay, so I would argue you've made two statements there. You're saying if it moves to the outer end, did it react? Not no. Yet, but... What does it have to do to react? It needs to react with an atom? It has to reach out to another atom. We're talking about how this electron can reach out and make contact with something else. Or we could flip it the other direction because if we look at my diagram here, is there a difference? What's the electron doing? Reaching out. What's that electron doing? Reaching out. Reaching out. What's the difference? Sorry. Still a single electron reaching out. Yeah. What's the difference? I mean, the space, like the one in the middle, it's kind of... Let's flip it. What's the other option? What is the difference now for the orange arrows? To make the bond, your electrons have to connect. Yeah, I guess distance. Is what distance? Between the electrons? Mm, but you're making the statement the electron has to be here. It doesn't have to be here. Where does it have to be? Within that circle. Yeah. To make the eclectic. The interaction, your electrons have to make contact, which means this thing has to reach in and make contact with that electron. Okay? So let's make it a little more exciting, you know, up the ante a little bit. If we touch that red dot, 20,000 volts, right? Unpleasant feeling. Okay? That would hurt, right? Which circle are you going to reach into? You're going to reach into the small one? Does everyone agree? You want to reach into the small hole. You touch the red dot, you get 20,000 volts. Why do you want the big one? Yeah, that electron's moving around that entire space, which means there's a larger percentage that what happens? I miss. And if I miss, I don't get shocked. What happens if an atom misses? It doesn't interact. It doesn't make a bond. What does this mean when we talk about size? The smaller the size, the more, reactive. the more reactive it becomes. Okay? If the electron is pinned to a tiny space, it's always going to make contact. All I got to do is bring another atom in, done. There it is. But if it's expanded over a larger area, I have to ensure that that electron is now at the specific place where the other atom impacts. That becomes more challenging. Could you explain how we can determine the size of different atoms? How do we determine the size? Does anybody remember lecture one of this semester? No, that's okay. Fair play. Okay, I knew the answer before I asked it. Okay. That goes all the way back to Gen Chem. You're supposed to know trends in size. Why do you need to know the trends in size? Because it predicts reactivity. When we go down a column, what happens to the size of the atom? It's larger. Why does it get larger? More, more, more. You get the exact same number of orbitals, whether you're at hydrogen or radon. I mean, unless you remember the two sides of the two things that just hate orbitals, and then the more protons it brings in. It's not just that you have more orbitals, it's that your electrons are occupying higher energy orbitals. 
right? So when we go down a column, what happens? You move from the first energy level to the second, to the third, to the fourth. That's progressively putting your electrons, on average, further from the nucleus, meaning it gets bigger. What happens when we go across a row? Smaller. Why? Because more protons can pull into the electrons more. So down a column, the protons go down? No. So your answer is BS. My answer is gold. It is wrong. My teacher taught me. Yep, they tell you that, or they told you that and something else, and you've chosen to ignore the something else. Uh, What's changing your size? Where's the electron? When we go down a column, it's an electron that's making it bigger. Why is it getting bigger? Where's that electron going? To a higher energy level. A higher energy level. When you go left to right, where's the electron going? The same energy. The same energy level. And because it goes to the same energy level, what happens to the size? It doesn't change. It doesn't change. But Kim didn't teach me that. I, I accept that. Okay? To a first approximation, it doesn't change. This is why what I tell you in lecture one is you need to know this trend because it allows us to understand that size across a row is irrelevant. It only matters going up and down. Okay. Which one's bigger, oxygen or nitrogen? As far as OCHEM is concerned, they're the same. Because to that approximation, it doesn't matter. It's not relevant. Just out of curiosity, which one is? Does it change? <laughs> no, but not in the Why? sense, just in general. Why? So what is the molar mass? Mm, no. What? Molar mass is a bit shaky. Because you're talking about neutrons, neutrons aren't having an effect. <coughs> so they say just if the electrons go to the exact same energy level, what should happen to the size? It shouldn't change. Okay. Does anything else change when you go left to right? Yeah, there are more electrons. That all go to the same energy level. So what else changes when you go left to right? Yeah, like the negativity has got more fill out more of that energy level. It also moves further to the right on the table, irrelevant. What else changes to the atom when you go left to right on a periodic table? What? That's what we're trying to answer. Why does it change? The electron goes to the exact same energy level. It shouldn't change. Why does it change? More protons, more neutrons, more electrons, more... Okay. It has more of everything. Do I care about more electrons? No. No. If we're talking about radius, we're talking about where the electron is located. Do I care about neutrons? No. No. Why? In there. Inside. Inside doesn't matter either. Okay, cool. It's in the nucleus. Do my protons change? Yes. Where are my protons? By the nucleus. So they're in the nucleus. So you just said neutrons don't have an effect. What does that mean about protons? Don't have an effect. So what should happen to your size? Stay the same. Stay the same, does it? Yes. No, it does not. The question becomes, why? You memorized a thing... Spit out the thing you memorized. What happens to the radius? Why? Dude, everything I memorized leaves my brain a week later. Which is exactly the problem. You need to stop memorizing it and start to apply the content. What changes when you move left to right? The protons and the neutrons. Should the neutrons have an effect on electrons? Why? They're neutral by definition. World War II breaks out. Do we care about Switzerland? Right? Is it Switzerland? <laughs> Three. One, one of those things. Yeah. They remain neutral. They don't do anything. We don't care. All they do is profit off everybody dying. Okay, cool. So we don't care about neutrons. What else changed? The protons. Should the protons have an effect on electrons? Yes. And then you'd stop saying it, which is mind-boggling to me. What are the protons as a positive going to do to negatives? Ah. You did not say it the very first time. No, you did not. Let me tell you what you said. You said more protons means it gets smaller. Does iodine have more protons than fluorine? 
Yes. Yes. Is iodine smaller than fluorine? No. Because Ta da! <laughs> <laughs> Therein lies your issue. Memorizing that protons cause it to get smaller is wrong. It doesn't. Size is dictated based off of electrons. Where are your electrons located? When you go down a column, you're going to a higher energy level. That's why they get further out. This is in the front, actually. Right? What happens when you move left, right? They go to the same energy level. So at a first approximation, there is no change. Absolutely true. And that's what organic chemistry works with. If you deal deeper, deeper into it, we also acknowledge that there's more protons. Those more protons do what to those electrons? Ah, a very subtle effect. Subtle enough that when we look at trends for atomic radius, as far as size goes, it's irrelevant left to right. Right? You're like, why are we talking about this? You started it, not me. You can keep saying that, and it'll bite you later. That's fine. So when we go through and look at this, Hydrogen versus oxygen, there's a difference in size. Yeah. Right? That size changes the reactivity significantly. What's the reactive atom here? Is there a size difference? Ding. Okay. So where is the difference? Okay. So now what's happening is we're moving beyond a localized atom effect, and we now have to say, what does the rest of the structure contribute to that overall reactivity? So now what you're pushing is saying, how does the next atom have an effect? How does the next atom have an effect? Is that going to have as large of an effect? No, because it's further away. Okay. If you want somebody to give you money, what do you do? Yeah. In person? Zell's where you get the money from. Probably they're more likely to give to you. They're more likely to give it to you in person because they're right next to you. Okay? If you shouted at somebody ten feet away, hey, give me some money, are they gonna do it? No, if you call them, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, that happens all the time. So you donate to all those people that call you. That's why we're getting all those freaking spam calls is because you keep giving them money. Stop it. <laughs> okay. The further that distance is, the less likely it contributes to that system. So when we're talking about reactivity, we go insanely local first. We find the most reactive thing, starting with charge, and then we start to evaluate differences. In this particular case, there was no difference between those. Where do you first see a difference? Okay. What is the difference? Um, one has another carbon, one has connected to a fluorine, and then one to a bromine. I didn't draw anything on that one. You know why I didn't draw anything on that one? You didn't tell me anything. There's nothing else connected there? It's a carbon with two hydrogens. Those hydrogens are part of the conversation. You need to include them in that conversation. Why did you include the other one? Do I care about those hydrogens as uniquely different? Yes, because Is there a hydrogen on this carbon? Yes. Does it have a third hydrogen there that I did not show? Does this one? Does this one? Is it different? No. So why did I not show it? It's not different. I don't care. Find the difference so that you can have an intelligent conversation about why it's different. How that difference is going to have an effect. Looking at how they're the same only allows you to say they're all the same. Can you enter that in a ranking? No. No, you can't. Which means you need the difference. So find the difference. So, where do you want to start? <clears throat> Sorry, I 
did a wild erase and then I wasn't paying attention to what you said. Top one. What are you comparing that top one to? The second bedrooms. Cool. So now what is the difference between those? And this is admittedly a tricky one for me. So size, is the size affecting this? No, the size is an immediate local thing. When we talk about trying to come up with this ranking system and how we evaluate those individual pieces, when we talk about molecular size, molecular size is in reference to everybody's favorite R word, resonance. We aren't looking at resonance here because we can't really do resonance. Okay. What this is going to boil down to is two possibilities. Electronegativity. Is there an electronegativity difference between carbon and hydrogen? Yes. Yeah, it's real subtle, but it is there. Or hyperconjugation is a fun, nasty word. This is one where I generally just memorize my way out of it and hope for the best. Okay. So hyperconjugation is what we'll talk about here as we address these two. So if we're talking about the difference between those, okay, electronegativity. Which one's more electronegative, carbon or hydrogen? Carbon. carbon. If that carbon is more electronegative, what is it doing to the next carbon in the chain? Extreme. Push it to the extreme. We're saying carbon is more electronegative than this hydrogen. So what is it doing to all of those electrons? Comparatively. It pulls them. Oh, if it pulls them, then this carbon's pissed, right? So what does it do? It pulls them. Then this carbon's pissed. So what does it do? Pulls those electrons. Where does it pull them? Slightly towards the molecule. We're talking about this acting as a base. What must a base do? How does it accept hydrogens? By being negative. What is it doing with that negative? Yeah, here's my base. We'll even give you a negative. Here's my H plus. We run that reaction. By making a bond with you. How did it make that bond? Electrons. It had to donate those electrons. Where did it donate those electrons? Where was the proton? Relative to the base. I know it's a weird question. We just said in this case, these electrons are going this way, right? Yeah. Where are the electrons going? Into the molecule. To act as a base, where do the electrons need to go? Outside of the molecule. Outside of the molecule. Mm. If the carbon is more electronegative than the hydrogen, what is it doing to those electrons? Drawing them inward, thereby making it? A weaker base. A weaker base. Neat. Okay. That's using carbon as an electronegative element more so than hydrogen. Why is that potentially problematic? What is the difference in electronegativity between carbon and hydrogen? It's insanely slight. Okay. It's so slight that when we bond a carbon to a hydrogen, what do we say happens to the charge? You don't get a charge because the difference in electronegativity is so small. Okay. So if the difference in electronegativity is negligible, then how do we explain it? Well, what else is the difference between carbon and hydrogen? The amount of electrons. And if carbon has more electrons, what can it start to do? It can push those electrons out towards the oxygen. We can move the electrons through the sigma bonds. This is why it's called hyperconjugation towards the oxygen. If the oxygen starts to gain more electrons, what happens to its reactivity? It becomes more reactive. So hyperconjugation versus an electronegativity result get different answers. With carbon and hydrogen, it's a coin toss, which is why I ultimately just take it as a coin toss and hope for the best. <laughs> So why ask the question if it's a coin toss? Because I want you to push through that thought process. Because does that thought process work for the other answers? Not entirely. 
It works perfectly. Oh, yes. Okay. And it's important to recognize that pattern through. Dealing with the difference between carbon and hydrogen is such a rare question to worry about. I don't want you stressing over it, but I do want you to be aware of that issue. Okay. So in ranking those two, deciding between them does become a challenge, and that could very well be your differential, is switching between those two. Why would we leave the, <clears throat> the other ones out of the question? Fluorine versus carbon or hydrogen, that's a huge difference in electronegativity. Bromine versus fluorine or versus hydrogen and carbon, huge difference in electronegativity. So the fluorine and the bromine are now solely an electronegativity argument. You're not floating in the margins. You're now floating in extreme differences. So between fluorine and bromine with a difference in electronegativity, what does that mean? If fluorine is more electronegative than carbon, what is it doing to the electrons in that bond? Pull it towards itself. There's a sneeze in there. Yeah, it didn't work. Um, which then means that oh, the next carbon pulling electrons, pulling electrons, which means those electrons are being pulled where? Away from the oxygen. Away from the oxygen. Does that make it stronger or weaker base? Weaker. Weaker. So the fluorine one should be weaker than your carbon and hydrogen. Awesome. How about bromine? Well, it's more electronegative than carbon and hydrogen, so it should be weaker. Yeah. Awesome. Did you compare fluorine to bromine? Which one's more electronegative? Fluorine. Fluorine, which means? The fluorine, one. the fluorine one is weaker than your bromine one. Mm -hmm. And then okay. the carbon and hydrogen, we just gas. It's coin toss. So, yep. Um, and it's, it's a coin toss because sometimes it switches. You get both options coming out. That's how close to the margin it is. I thought that um, since fluorine would be smaller than bromine, it would be more reactive. So that's an interesting point. Fluorine is smaller than bromine. Shouldn't the fluorine be more reactive? But it's not the thing we care about. That's relevant when you're talking about the atom size holding the charge. So if I shift to the conversation of HBr versus HF, which one's the stronger acid? So now we run to, well, fluorine is smaller, which makes it more reactive. If it's more reactive, or sorry, electronegative. If it's more electronegative, okay, it should hold the electrons better than the bromine, I believe is what you're trying to say, right? Yeah. So HF should be the stronger acid. Theoretically, you should have been told to memorize strong acids. Yes. HCl was one of them. What else was a strong acid? HBr, H2SO4. HNO3, HI. I think I said H2SO4 already. Yeah. HSO3. And that's it. Oh, there's the CLOs. You yeah. could throw those in there too if you wanted. HF isn't one you're told to memorize. Well, dang. Why not? It's weak. Why is it weak? It's more electronegative. What else is the difference between bromine and fluorine? Size. So as we start to talk about these things, what if we start to summarize now what we've addressed? We started with looking at charge, right? We talked about size. We talked about electronegativity. I hate writing out the word electronegativity. Chi is officially the symbol. We talked about resonance, okay? And then we talked about, we didn't actually use the word, but we'll get back to it, induction. All of these are different ways or different qualitative things that you can use to evaluate your stability. Which one is more important? Yeah, absolutely right, okay? That which one is more important comes down to actually memorizing these and now using that to apply the content out. You'll note that it's written in a particular order because which one's the most important? Charge. Charge, followed by? Size. Size. Why is that relevant? Which one is bigger, bromide or fluoride? Uh, bromide. Bromide, which means which one's more stable? 
Bromide or fluoride? Bromide. bromide. If bromide's more stable, which acid is the stronger acid? And so this is where things become really problematic is you're looking at 50-50 coin tosses for a lot of these statements. And if you aren't critically precise in each of your assessments, all you've turned it into is a raw coin toss all the way through. Yeah, I would agree. This is why you need to practice and deal with those ranking systems to evaluate each of those stabilities. Bromide being larger means the conjugate base is more stable. If the conjugate base is more stable, the acid is the stronger acid. That's all you learned in 152. Right? Size trumps electronegativity. Then resonance, then induction. Is this perfect? No. There are absolutely exceptions. We already talked about one of the exceptions. Nitrogen was an exception to this. So what you are doing every time you're being asked to rank stabilities is looking at these things and trying to find the difference. So when we go through and look at these, we start with charge. What happened with the charge? All the same. All the same, so irrelevant. The atom that holds the charge is all the same. That size, that's electronegativity. These top three things are all atom effects. Everything else is a molecule effect or a molecular effect. Okay. A lot of people don't like seeing detail within that, and so instead they go through and memorize cario. Cario is this. It's identical. Well, it's identical in a worse way. It removes information. Cario is charge, followed by A. Josh, you remember it? Atom effect. Which atom effect? Size or electronegativity? I don't know. You just got to memorize that extra. You mean your acronym is stupid. Okay. Resonance, induction, and then O for orbitals. And the problem with O, which isn't on the list here, is there's a myriad of different things that you could go to to evaluate stability in that last category. It's one that is typically very specific to an individual question. Okay. Orbitals having a play. Hybridization is orbitals. Substitution patterns, that was tertiary, secondary, primary. That's in that six, as I discuss it, O carp. Because I can't swear on a slide. Okay. I'm way overdone. I apologize. <laughs>